as a CFO, I've been trying to not just say, oh, you got to do that. No, you can't. But no, you can't do that that way. But maybe we can do it this way. So, so trying to be more flexible and also more kind of explain to people why they can't do it. Just say no, then they won't learn. Dollars. Dollars. Meaning you work with numbers? Oh, it's so much more than that. Modernization by streamlining the process. So let's get right down to business. This is The Closers. Hey, Ulf. Thanks for joining me today here at SubConnect in Stockholm. So happy you could join me. Thank you. Happy to be here. So we always start off every episode just kind of getting to know you a little bit. Curious what you like to do for fun when you're not in the office. Most recently, well, since a couple of years back, I've taken up golf, actually, at the very, very late stage of my life. But anyways, so I'm trying to get better at that and trying to play as much as I can. I like, you know, I'm really into music and... Uh, been been for a very long time listening to music predominantly rock music but but various kinds uh, and reading and movies and also traveling a lot I'm trying to travel a lot with with my fiance to we're trying to do to visit various places and where I've been before or, where, or what's new to both of us so it's um, it's a mixed bag nice now do you guys have a favorite destination together hard to say I mean I, it was very nice to to take it back to Northern California, where I used to live years ago, so and show her, the, you know, the mountains and the the redwoods and the ocean and all of those things. And I lived in a small place called Santa Cruz on on the coast. So, oh, it's beautiful yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Now I have to ask because you just started to play golf. How do you feel about the America's golf courses versus over here? I haven't played that much in the U.S. to be honest. So, uh, but I, the European ones tend to be rougher, and the U.S. ones tends to be in better shape, if you will, <laughs> nicer fairways and more well kept in that sense. Even though, of course, the the links courses in in England, particularly, are, are more they're supposed to be that way. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I am a golf fan myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, haven't gotten to play over here mm-hmm. in uh, EMEA just yet, but maybe uh, we'll have to. I'll take you up on it. We can go play golf sometime. Yeah, yeah, for sure. One of the things that I ask on every episode, uh, and I've I've gotten a really interesting um, array of answers on this one, but curious how you refer to the holistic process of um, capturing an order all the way through revenue recognition and reporting. Is it order to revenue, quote to revenue, lead to reporting? I've heard all kinds of different answers. I guess it depends a bit where you're coming from, but for me, I think it's got to be order to cash because it starts, I mean, if it starts already from from what you say and how you capture an order with a with a customer. More importantly, if you're able to deliver the correct things to the customer, you got to start there. So you got to have the whole process. And at the end of the day, to to be able to recognize it and to invoice it, that's great. But you also preferably should get paid. So, <laughs> so I, I think when you look at it, you have to look at the whole process, starting already from order generation to cash collection. Absolutely love it. Um, so let's get into your career a little bit. Um, you and I have been talking a little bit um, before you joined me here on, on the episode. Curious if you can walk me through the progression of your career from maybe some of your earliest jobs that you've had all the way through to where you are today. Yeah. Uh, well, just looking at my face, I've been around for a while. <laughs> so, so I actually started in software already in 1990 at uh, uh, what then was one of the larger PC-based software company, Boland International. Mm. Uh, started here in, in, in Sweden, worked for a couple of years, moved to California with them because they were based in, in Scotts Valley, which is in between San Jose and Santa Cruz up in the mountains. Uh, it was, I think it was number three or four of, of the PC-based software companies, yeah. size-wise then. Now it's, been, it's gone and acquired by others. But anyway, so I started there, worked there for, moved to Paris with them. As I had a role of, firstly, of, Swedish or Scandinavian controller, and then being uh, European controller for them. Firstly, based in California, which <laughs> kind of looks a little weird, but anyways. <laughs> and then they moved me to the European headquarters, as I was there for a couple of years. And then I changed jobs in whilst in Paris and started with kind of 
uh, IT services, I should say, working for EDS, uh, which was, again, then, it seems to be a common thread here. <laughs> Every company I work for is no longer in existence. <laughs> but anyways, uh, EDS was, was acquired by HP l- l- later and became uh, HP services. But EDS was then one of the, the largest IT services company, mm-hmm. basically the one who started outsourcing of, of, of IT services. Uh, but I joined them as uh, director of internal audit for EMEA. Uh, it was a pretty big job. I mean, EDS had like 50,000 employees in Europe, so yeah. it was huge. Uh, very different, but quite a learning because the, the, the emphasis there was on trying to educate rather than to, to audit, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, so the, 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 the aim was to try and get people the accounts which are set the organization set up to service a specific customer to do the right thing themselves <laughs> rather than to tell them what they had to do so that was the philosophy of the audit director in in, in then in Plano in Dallas outside Dallas so, so worked there moved back to Sweden with EDS uh, left EDS 2000 joined a Swedish company called StreamServe which is actually legally set up as a US corporation so we actually followed US Gap and things like that, even though I was based in Sweden. I uh, was there for quite some time. Uh, as, the, as its CFO, that was the first when I moved into a CFO role. Mm-hmm. Was CFO for about 10 years. And then, uh, as you and I talked about, I was COO <laughs> for like four months <laughs> because the, then we were acquired by OpenText, who's a Canadian software company listed on the NASDAQ. So in the conjunction with the, the due, due diligence and everything, I moved back into the CFO role to make because I, I knew everything, and the, the, the poor guy who was a new CFO, <laughs> of course, had to, didn't have the same experience. So we, moved, we went through that and was there for, for a couple of years and, and actually ended up running the, the business segment uh, called Customer Communication Management, which was the, the streams of product within OpenText for about a year and a half. Left there and then joined Snow Software as its CFO back in 2013. And uh, we, of course, we had massive growth, expanded into multitude of countries, et cetera. And um, it was a very, very interesting ride with, with, with Snow because we did real well. Um, left Snow in 2019 and then joined the company where I'm currently at called Findity uh, in, to, in 2020 because I've actually been helping out a little bit with our company even kind of during weekends or evenings while whilst I was at Snow in the beginning. And then uh, the, so we provide a expense management software where you basically can process your tri- highly automated and adopted to tax rules in the jurisdictions we support, which is Nordics, Germany, UK, etc. in order to, 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 in order trying to make it facilitate and make it as easy as possible for the customers uh, that use it. And we have about we're, whilst we're a small company, we still have almost 300,000 end users and about 32,000 end user organizations that we service, predominantly through partners. But we do have kind of about 25% of the business is direct also. And that's where I'm now. And actually, I'm, I'm, I just stepped down as its CFO and becoming its senior advisor now because of, as I was alluding to in the beginning, that I'm not getting any younger. So... So we have a new 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 guy who's taken on the role, and I'm helping him out for 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 a period of time. That's incredible, and I think it's really exciting to hear about all the things you have coming up too with your retirement and and being able to look forward to being more on the advisory side yep. than being in the thick of the day to day, which um, I'm sure is a welcome change for you. <laughs> it would be. I'm very happy to continue working to 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 maybe half time whatever, but mm-hmm. but at least not having that operational day-to-day responsibility as, as before. So that, looking forward to that. So I'm so interested about your short stint as COO versus all of the time you spent as CFO. Where did you see some of the biggest differences um, when you took on that? Hard to say in four months' time, but, <laughs> but um, I did at that time get, also get, res- get responsibility for our partner organization. Mm. Uh, so I worked a lot with some of the partner managers who were supporting the, the, the partner customers. We have a partner distribution channel through partners we had with, with StreamServe at the time. Uh, and it was just in, in, the inf- in its infancy. We were basically yeah. getting started. And then, of course, the, the deal c- came up where basically all hands on deck in order to make sure that we went through the diligence and everything correctly for, for, the, for, for the open text acquisition. But um, 
based on <laughs> on my limited experience then of the CEO role, it, it's obviously it, it it was a CEO role, not responsible. You know, in one context, it could be responsible for marketing, for sales. So it, it was kind of focused on the 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 partner and the admin side of of of, of, of the house, rather than than you know the whole. You have a, you could have a CFO role who, who basically encompasses everything, yeah. all, more or less. Yeah. yeah. So interesting. And, you know, I think the other part that I wanted to dive into a little bit more is around the internal audit work that you did. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting that the viewpoint at the time was around um, educating the organization around the things that they should be doing. Mm -hmm. I've had a, a recent conversation with some folks uh, very s similar to that mm -hmm. around when it comes to, like, say, sales teams working with um their their finance teams or their revenue teams and understanding how they can put deals together or the things that yeah. they should think about yeah. feels very similar to that. What were some of the benefits that you saw from being able to go and educate the folks in your organization? Well, firstly, it was a much more interesting prospect for, for me personally <laughs> to do <laughs> rather than a traditional hardcore auditing, you know, mm -hmm. going and check with checklist. We, of course, had to do that to some degree. But the general consensus, and, and driven by the, the, the forward-looking audit director we had, was that not just tell them what to do, but explain why they have to do it. And hopefully, then that they actually see the benefits of doing it right from the beginning, because it will, it will end up being in a better position than if you don't. So uh, I think it was, it was um, quite gratifying in order to for the audits you did that where, where you kind of felt oh you have a response you have you have kind of you get through some other accounts maybe they're more like okay auditors mm, yeah yeah I hear you yeah. you know and I'm curious too did did you take that on going forward in maybe some of your other roles after that in how you approached relationships with other cross-functional teams for, for sure as a CFO I've been trying to not just say oh you got to do that mm -hmm. no you can't but no, you can't do that that way, but maybe we can do it this way. So, so trying to be more flexible and also more kind of explain to people why they can't do it. Just say, no, then they won't learn. But if you understand that you can't do it this way, because if you sign a contract looking like this, we can never recognize the revenue. I mean, it will sit in the balance sheet forever. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, but if they understand that you can't do it, or certain things you can't, can't kind of uh, in include in the deal, then they, they, they would probably, at least you get away with 80% of the issues to start with. Then the intricacies of certain things, maybe you have to, from, as a finance or rhetoric expert, you have to get into, but the rest, the sales organization would understand. Yeah. You know, and it's funny from my past too, um, from having deal desks and, and that sort of thing and, and kind of having a similar approach and going in and educating the sales function and even some of the other folks who are involved in, in different things, like even marketing to yeah. an extent um, and the things that we're offering and, and setting out to do. But what I found too is then those folks would bring me in sooner to be part of the negotiations or the commercials of a, a particular deal that they were trying to work through um, just kind of having that relationship and, you know, I feel like I could trust them a little bit more. They probably trusted me to get involved as well. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I see that as like a recurring yeah, theme. Uh, exactly. And that's what happened eventually. Yeah. Firstly, it's like, don't hinder me. Don't, <laughs> don't, you don't get in the way when I'm trying to do the deal. But after a while, when they actually, you help them to do the deal, you, you get it right, you're able to, you get it through the system, it's recognized, they get paid, yep. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Then they would actually turn to you. Yeah, they know and, it's going to be. And that, that, that happened. Yeah. That you get contacted by our sales organization. We have this deal. We need to do this. We need to do that. So, so as the CFO, both at StreamServ as well as on Snow, I spent 30, 40, well, 30, let's say. Let's not exaggerate. 30% of my time yeah. speaking to sales or regional managers trying to help them kind of get the deal set up in the right way. Yeah. And then to your point, you have a recognizable yeah. deal instead yeah. of... And of course, this was to some degree back in the day pre-subscription. <laughs> yeah. So that means that, you, of course, the intent was to be able to recognize the, 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 the license up front and do, not do things that, that prevented you from doing it. With subscription, it's a little bit of an easier concept. Yeah, exactly. You want that predictable yeah. overtime yeah. Uh, recognition.
So you spoke about a number of experiences where you were either in country um, doing the or heading up the finance uh, organization, or maybe even out of country supporting um, a different region. How talk to me a little bit about that and how you know were there intricacies there or challenges that you had? Yeah, I mean it, it is both accounting, tax, legal compliance, and all these things particularly with at snow where we operated in in over 20 countries then you, you of course you have to you have to get your accounting right and you have to maybe do it on on corporate books mm-hmm. if, if that's IFRS gap or if it's US gap or whatever kind of your 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 uh, which have a gap you apply on on a group basis but you also may have to, like in certain places like France you have to keep local accounts based on the plan comptable which is the French accounting rules so you have to set the, you have to be able to cater for both in one way or the other you can either keep two books <laughs> consistently or you can convert one at the end of the year to to the other in order to report etc so so you have to follow that you have to get all all the accounting mechanics set up either by having kind of working in a common system or you having use of, of local accounting firms or both mm-hmm. most people probably do both at the end of the day depending on size uh, you have tax, different tax rules everywhere. You have t- different VAT schemas, even though Europe is supposed to be harmonized, but really isn't <laughs> on, on, on VAT. So you have to be able to cater for, for basically reporting and, and, and also capturing and everything uh, in the correct way. Um, you have just general income tax considerations, and, and you have different type of tax rules on on, for instance, uh, depreciation of, of assets. You can only do it for tax reasons. You, maybe you have a group, you have you depreciate it over, let's say, three years, but you can't do that here because tax-wise you've got to do it over five years, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to cater for all of that. So it, 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 it becomes quite complex. Yeah. Uh, maybe not technically complex, but just a multitude of various things you have to consider and all the filings, VAT filings, tax filings, Filing of statutory accounts, you got to have to get audit set up in each of these jurisdictions. It may be that you you are required to have local auditors, but you don't need from a group perspective. Your 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 group auditors may not care about that legal entity because it's small enough for them to et cetera et cetera. But you still have to do it on for, based on on the local requirements and rules. So it it just becomes a lot. Yeah, absolutely. How did you handle that? Well, I mean, uh, we had. Talking about mostly about snow, we, we actually started out having very much a, a shared service center concept. Mm-hmm. We were trying to cap, cover for everything out of Stockholm. We had finance managers caring for various countries, but also working with local uh, agencies in each country in order to take care of some of the you know, in-country filings and things yeah. like that. But they, our finance managers were responsible for making sure it happened. And as you grow and it becomes more complex, you get more people in place, we actually branched out and having kind of controllers or finance directors in some of the larger organizations or some of the larger uh, jurisdictions. Uh, for instance, with Snow, we had almost 150 people in the U.S. So so we had to, of course, had a, had a local finance director in the U.S. taking care of it. And, and same in the U.K., same in, in Germany, but covering maybe all of, of kind of Central Europe, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So you have, you have to find a model that works. But more, the most important thing is to find good people, yeah, yeah, right people who understands and actually are are, are approachable to these are the needs of the corp of the corporation. Mm-hmm. Then I need to cater for my my organization locally too. But you have to understand that there are, you have to basically be able to, to to cater for or serve both purposes. Yeah, and I I imagine there's probably a lot that comes down to culture and how you communicate with one another and that sort of thing. Was that ever a challenge or things that you had to sort of deal with? To some degree, there are cultural differences for sure. Maybe between extremes between France and, and, and the U.S. as mm-hmm. being very different in, in how they approach things. But I think you can overcome that and will overcome that. You have to communicate, but you have to find, when you hire, you have to try and find the right people. Yeah. Who are open to and understand that you, this, this, this is the multiple purpose of, of, of being here. We have, the, from an accounting perspective, we have to take care of the local things, but we also have to report every month in close to books on, on a group basis and all of these things. So I think most importantly, you have to find the right people, and then you have to have 
kind of cons cons consistent follow up and conversations and and uh, if that means you have kind of recurring one on ones or if you have quarterly meetings of of the of the team or et cetera et cetera so it communication is incredibly important, but the most important thing i think is try try and find the right people in in for for each each role yeah and how about from like a technology stack perspective were you on one system for all of your different um, entities or different countries or w whatever that might look like? Or did you have multiple that then rolled up into a single ERP? What did that look like? We had, we had multiple initially, and we were moving towards uh, getting a, a common platform, also from an accounting perspective, in order to, to facilitate things. But, but uh, initially, then, uh, we were still using spreadsheet reporting in order to, to for, for consolidation purposes. But then, then uh, gradually we got a consolidation system uh, and we're using other tools like Blackline, for instance, for reconciliation and so on. And, and then we, we tried to, to move there. And then uh, during my last year, we, we actually initiated a, a, a move towards a, a common system, also from, from an accounting perspective. Mm -hmm. But also we're trying to capture, we were trying to go all the way from particularly in conjunction with with RevRec mm -hmm. and and requirements of IFRS 15, in order to to set something up that basically we used Salesforce a, as a tool in order to provide the data capture into to all the ways so you can basically automate the whole flow of of of, of um, going from from order to to billing to to account to accounting. But um, obviously, it's a tall order, particularly if you have a prior life of 10, 10 years plus of doing deals maybe not in the best way <laughs> in order to try and cater for the various type of of uh, scenarios you, you you could could so it, it it was it was a tough tough job to to get it done yeah i can only imagine um now having experience both in the states here in Europe, um, what are some of the business trends that you see maybe being either similar or very different? Um, I know from my perspective, sometimes I see uh, certain finance topics being more, uh, I'll say, heavily focused on in one region versus the other. Did you find that at all? Hard to say. I mean, most recently now, the company I'm at now, find it the we're, we're we're a very small company, so so it's we're not really exposed to to international business in the sense we have operations in in the UK, but um, but I still think just to a large degree it's the same type of topics. Even though the US tend to be maybe a little bit ahead in in certain areas, I mean if you use the use of AI, uh, use of, of of automation tools, RPA or or whatever it is, um, uh, and, and see where how you can accommodate that. And given the fact that where I'm at now, we've been talking about it, we've been looking at various things, we really haven't gotten there yet because of, of the fact that we're, we're a small organization and, and this is a significant effort and significant investment in order to, to take the next steps. But we're definitely thinking about it, but we haven't done it yet. Otherwise, I think, I don't think there is a huge difference between me, I should say, or Europe and, and the U.S. In, in that sense, I think the trends generally tend to be the same, even though maybe initiated a bit earlier in the U.S. That makes sense. And so for some of the things that you're thinking about doing now that you're alluding to, can you give us a little bit of an indication on what some of those things are, knowing that they're probably pretty relevant to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be trying to, to automate to a larger degree we invoice our customers in arrears based on actual consumption. And a lot of the, the data capture is manual mm -hmm. from, from basically from using our own system, which keeps track of all the users and everything by account, all these 32,000 accounts. And then we basically create invoices from that. Some of it, we've we actually been able to automate the, our direct business, but now we're trying to deal with our partner business, which is a larger part. Larger part from a, from a value perspective, not from a volume perspective. Yeah. Um, and um, so we're trying to take that, that step. We are using a tool uh, which is pretty automated. So we have kind of invoice scanning on the other side, meaning suppliers' invoices coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we automated this. We've done a lot of automation, actually, even though a small company. But, it, but it's the, the, the order to invoice, if you will, that process that we work mostly working with in order to try and 
to, to get a higher degree of automation. And um, we're also thinking about how we can, can we use AI in that, in that sense. Um, but uh, I mean, we, but even more so, we're thinking about how can you use AI in the product we supply to our customers? Because we're trying to be, for instance, right now to keep trying to keep track of we, we have the, the product is adopted or the, the service is adopted to six jurisdictions i think where it fo where it knows and follows the tax rules when you put in an expense but maybe the concept of using ai in order to continuously try and understand and track changes that are going on in in the le local legislation in order to to make sure that our product adopts correctly to that is something we're thinking about AI is so interesting to me right now. I think everyone's trying to figure out what it means to yeah. their own business, how it can help them in their day-to-day, -day, whatever whatever that might look like. Um, have you thought about how that might impact your finance team at all, um, you know, outside of what you would be thinking about for AI for your customers? Not really, to be honest, in, in the sense that we, we try, we, we, we obviously, as I said, we've been talking about and discussing AI but not, not in, in the context of how we could actually use it. It's more automate, automation of, of certain processes, which mm -hmm. is more kind of, which doesn't necessarily require AI in, in itself, but, but in order to, to do that. But um, no, I, I don't have a good example right now, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's fair. And mm -hmm. I think we're all trying to figure out what that yeah. looks like. I mean, I'm all for if someone can you know, leverage AI to figure out how to get my kids up in the morning. So <laughs> I'll take it in any way it comes. Yeah. Um, so as you've been kind of going through and figuring out what automation looks like at Findity or maybe some of the other organizations you've been at, um, how do you approach the idea around ROI as it, uh, as it relates to automation? Like, how do you think of that uh, from a CFO perspective? Well, I mean, obviously we're trying to, I mean, some of the larger investments we've done, we're trying to do a kind of a, a concept. What it does it mean? What is the cost? What's, what what is going to be? What is the project cost? What is the benefit? But it's of administrative systems. It, it's very hard because of the fact that there's no direct kind of revenue or income associated with it. It's more cost avoidance right, in right. that sense. So it is hard. We're trying to do it in order to, to try and get a sense, do a, do a business case for an, for an investment, for instance, trying to understand what, 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 what the benefits or the, the actual return would be in order to do this. But I mean, the return could be, we will cope with the current staffing rather than having to hire five more people because we have a lot, a lot better systems and more automated processes, mm -hmm. for instance. So, it, so it's, more, it's a lot of an alternative cost concept rather than, than a direct kind of hard benefit of, of money coming in. I find it difficult, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, and you know, it's something that having been through a few automation projects myself um, and, and leading that, having to come up with that business case is mm -hmm. particularly difficult. Mm -hmm. It's, And it's more sometimes qualitative versus yes. quantitative. Yes. Um, maybe it impacts the bottom line more than the top line type yeah. of thing, as, yeah. as you suggested. And so I'm always trying to like figure out what are those key points that we can start to like pull the thread on around what kind of savings it would be to your point around headcount that that's a, a fabulous example of yeah. it um especially too like at a, at a smaller company like find a t as as you mentioned um is there something that you maybe um i don't want to say value more than another but how do you think of that from a find a d pers perspective when you're thinking about automation because Obviously, you can't throw a bunch of heads at it if you if your company already yeah. has only so many people. How do you kind of like think about that or, or balance that out? Well, I mean, we're trying to step by step, given the fact that uh, we're, as I said, we're, we're is a small organization. The finance team is a small organization. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to take step by step in order to, we have pretty comprehensive monthly KPI reporting and, of course, balance sheet, cash flow, and all these things. Sure. Uh, but which are, to, to some degree, automated, but some degree is not. Uh, but also the, the, the transactional parts of finance, wh where we try and we have automated some things and some other things, particularly on the, on the getting from order or data capture on the order to, to, to invoices is an area where, which we're working on. Uh, but I think... Again, being a small organization, the, the, the main objective now is for us to cope 
with, a, with the limited resources we have. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of that you have 45 people in accounting. You, you, can make, you, you can basically reorganize that and maybe free up five, six, seven headcount. It's more a matter of we don't have to add a headcount in order to still cope that if, if we have a better, better structure or better processes. Yeah. But it's systems, but it's also processes. That yeah. With it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's funny, like, I'm, I'm kind of curious, based on, you know, your time at Snow versus Findity, do you see a difference in the level of um, investment that folks are willing to make? I mean, obviously, size of company makes makes a difference, but are there fundamental differences that you see in sizes of companies and what you're able to do? Don't think so. I think I think we're both the respective board and 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 senior management, CEO, etc., was open to to if you plead your case why we have to do certain mm -hmm. things. Then obviously in, at Snow we had much larger investments, much bigger project, given the fact that the company is much much bigger than than what Find It is. Um, but conceptually, I think both organizations have been open to 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 make those changes if you can basically plead your case and, and, and state why 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 we need to do this. Because I think we, we had a concept in, in, in management that in order for us to grow, but then we need to do this in order to, to be able to, to cater for a much higher volume. We have high ambitions in, in finding it, even though, as I said, I'm, I'm leaving at the end of the year, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter for the fact, that it doesn't change the fact that the company have, have high ambitions in, in growth. And in order to, for, for, it, for finance to be able to handle that, yeah. we need to do certain things, which the, the CFO and I are very much in, in line, in tune about what, what we need to do. So, I think that's great because I see so many companies that, I'll say, talk the talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, they don't actually want to spend some of that money. Yeah. You know, they, they're forward thinking to an extent that they have these great goals, but until they can really understand and accept what they've yeah. got to do to make that happen um that's where i see companies be truly um successful and be able to move the needle yeah. curious if um like especially at findity where you maybe have limited resources how would you attack an automation project that requires your current resources to be involved like i know sometimes when you've got automation going into a finance team that is smaller but you need those finance resources to help with the automation project, but you also need to do the day-to-day -day and keep yeah. the lights on. How do you approach something like that? Yeah, we haven't really been exposed to it, but, mm -hmm. but we, we've had, so we've been able to cater for it because you absolutely have to be involved in yeah. in, in a, a whatever you're doing, if you're implementing a new system, if, if you, you have to take the time, spend the hours, and still have to do your own work. I mean, you, you can. I think you can shuffle around certain things we've been we've been helped out by a little bit by other organizations within finity you know to 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 take care of some of the transactional processing whilst mm -hmm. we've been focusing on some of the other things but um but we've been blessed in the sense that we were able to cope without any major changes but otherwise you need you clearly need to free up the resources available to to in order to be, you can't trust basically your your outside whatever kind of uh, system provider or even implementation partner of that mm -hmm. system provided for you to help with. You need, you need to have certain resources to take care of yourself. And you need to apply your best resources in order to make sure that the new processes become what you want them to be. Yep. And, and actually, it's, it's a step forward rather than a step backwards. I think you just have to be creative in order to try and to, to do that. But you have to bring in some, some resource in order to, to shift out kind of your resources some degree you just have to bite the bullet and work a little more yeah which is not long-term sustainable right. but 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 you have to do it so it's a mix of those things yeah but fabulous answer you know i think sometimes i see folks in a um almost in a holding pattern because yeah. they almost don't know what to do and there are there are there are uh, handoffs or there are certain compromises that yeah. need to be made sometimes but if those compromises are made in the effort of the, you know, having this benefit long term, I think you know, just yeah. having a forward-thinking leader to be able to, you know, feel confident enough yeah. to do that and bite the bullet. Last question for you: uh, What do you think prevents accounting teams from uh, really elevating their role within the organization? I think it's a multitude of things. 
Firstly, I think it's self-confidence within finance uh, you ha that you have to kind of become know that you're you have to you have to get involved at certain stages in in deals or in in, in deal reviews or whatever it might be, or be able to provide value to the business. It could be in analysis, could be in in the mu multitude of things. But you have to find the time, obviously. Yeah. So, so because if you bog down in transactional finance, then in order to do that, but you also have to have the confidence and the skill, I guess, implicitly, in order to to step up and 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 try to partner with you know. A couple of years ago, it was very business partnering was very popular. It's a term I haven't heard that much in maybe the last two years, but mm -hmm. but still, you want your finance manager to be your, the business partner of of, let's say, if you have in-country organization of, of the, the local manager or whatever, they team up and, and try to, to run to work the business and the finance person is very supportive of it. But I think it's it's skill, it's confidence. If I guess maybe they go go hand in hand. Sure. Um, and uh, it's also the, the able to, 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 to set yourself up and that's where automation comes in in order to find the time to, to bring more value to the business because I think, I strongly believe and at least finally we're kind of blessed with the fact that also our internal partners believe that there's a huge value of finan in finance trying to be be involved and help out. Yeah, but I think that's a great point. You know, I think so often accounting teams feel like I've got this duty to, yeah. you know, close the books and report accurately, which is true. Yeah. Um, but their benefit and, and all the advantages and things that they can provide go far beyond that. So being able to elevate their teams um, with confidence and put them yeah. in that light is, is a great point. Yeah, it's a dip, they put a different perspective on things. Yeah, It's not that, for instance, sales necessarily is trying to avoid certain things. They just they have a different mindset. Yeah. So if you get a well-rounded, of course, you want legally involved also and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we also, you, you, can, you can look at a... a potential contract or an issue, whatever, from, from various angles, then you probably get a better answer if you apply more, more kind of different thoughts processes towards. Absolutely agree. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. So nice to do this in person. Thank you so first much. First official one, and nice uh, hope to have you back sometime soon. We never know. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Zora Revenue. Automate revenue recognition for any business model, enabling your teams to reconcile and report on revenue in real time. Listeners, my DMs are always open to you. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn at mdaigle, that's E-M-D-A-I-G-L-E, -E, and follow me for insights that help accounting leaders grow in their career, modernize their teams, and ultimately become more influential partners in business. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.